the conversation I had last evening with some diplomats and uh, some UN officials that actually affirmed a lot of what Prof was saying this morning, that at many times we beat ourselves as Kenya, and I guess Lain has also attributed when we talking about the Naira and the Kenya shilling. And uh, because, and for good reasons, because we don't measure ourselves against the region, which is good. We measure ourselves against what we aspire to, countries out there and what they've done. And sometimes we forget how long it's taken them to get there, and so we beat ourselves for that. But it's also very good because we measure ourselves with the best. But one of the things that uh, struck my mind was to listen to them talking about why Kenyans don't need to give themselves third heart when you look at the, the rest of Africa, either the south, the north, the west, and we know what's happening a lot of the West Africa, especially some of the four or five countries that's happening. And uh, someone showed us the map. And if you look at the coups that are happening currently, they are not just happening. There's a strategy because they're moving across a region from the West Coast all the way to Sudan. All those countries are connected. But that's not where Kenya is. And they kept saying, when they've worked in all those countries, even in their own countries in Europe, there's no place like Kenya. And they talked about some of the things Prof was saying about the human resource development. Of course, it's time we are re-looking really at it because of the new challenges we are, we are looking at as a, as a world. But even one of them said how she's had to get um, a house help for her family back in West Africa just because of the trustworthiness and the work um, steadiness and quality of work at that level. She's not even talking about someone who has had the experience or who's trained who has had a degree, but at that level of our domestic worker. You know? And so for me, that challenged my mind to think of what we have as a country and what we can do more with it. You know? And they said, Kenyans, if you only keep protecting it, you know, don't get where we are in West Africa, the challenges. She keeps saying when she goes home, and this is the, from the UN, that she carries money in a bag. And here she thinks she doesn't leave her house because she does all her transactions on M-Pesa. And sometimes we forget some of those things. The other things they said, when they compare in the UN, Kenya, they don't use other countries. They use New York, Geneva, and Vienna, and Kenya when they're talk talking about the UN services. And those, for me, that was a good story to start thinking about where we are and then how do we deal with some of the challenges? So I'll stop there, just taking from where Prof had begun. Thank you, DTB, for giving us this opportunity to talk about our country and about our economy. When my friend, uh, Professor Ndungu, was speaking, I decided to check up on his last WhatsApp message he sent me. <laughs> <laughs> it happened that it was on, 20, on 5th of May, 2020. <laughs> and, and after watching um, a program I had on, on TV, the following morning he sent me a message. And he said, um, of course, and a very good document he wrote about the COVID-19 and the fragility of the economy in Africa. But he, he ended by saying, please pump sense to this government. <laughs> so um, now he's on the other side. Is in the government, and so when we try to uh, say the few words that I've been saying always, well, um, I'll just be trying to do the same thing that you've asked me to do to sense uh, to, to pump some sense. But I want to say that generally, one of the things that I have liked in this country is the democratic space that allows us to debate, that allows us to engage government any level. This is not something that we take for granted. And some of the times when we criticize government, it's like the jockey, you know, the horse. I mean, you whip the horse, not because you don't like it, but you want it to increase speed. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we say things about government, we just want them to do better, even when we know they're trying. So I think we will be discussing some of those, and I want to thank you all for this um, uh, great opportunity to uh, look at our economy. Thank you. I want to pick from what Prof. said, and this resonates with the theme of, the, of this forum, which talks about risks, opportunities, and challenges. 
And Prof has, even, has told us that we, have, we are in a difficult economic environment that we acknowledge. It's not just been faced in Kenya, but it's globally. But again, when we look at what opportunities do we have, do we have any opportunities in such a difficult economic environment? Are there opportunities, yes, are there risks? So I hope that as we engage in this conversation, we'll be able to look at what opportunities do we have, uh, how can we mitigate against the risks that we are seeing, and what are the challenges we are facing? Because when we acknowledge the challenges we are facing, then we are able to map out how do we navigate these challenges. And the fact that we have seen Kenya has remained very re resilient. We've seen that despite all these uh, challenges, we are, we are able to grow even above the sub-Saharan African region countries. So it tells us even as we go into 2023 in the near term, in the medium, in the medium term, we'll continue to see this resilience and there are, there are opportunities that we can all take advantage of. Uh, so thank you. Um, thank you, Naomi. Uh, Mr. Sahi, did we beat ourselves too hard as Kenyans? Uh, first, let me say thank you for having me here. So I thought a good place to start for me would be to look at um, a survey that PwC as a global network carries out every year, uh, engaging with CEOs to try and understand what would be important to them, what's their view and uh, economic outlook, what are they concerned about and uh, what, what mitigating uh, measures can be undertaken by themselves and other stakeholders. So I thought that would be a good place to start. So listening to the Honorable CS today, uh, I would have thought he was reading from that survey, so he did say lots of uh, good things. And I also heard him say multiple times, I think there were people recording him, he said they have the solutions. So indeed, uh, very keen to hear what those solutions are and, uh, and uh, uh, so that we can stop beating ourselves up as Kenyans, uh, listening to him today and having listened to other conversations that have been taking place in the last few months. I am optimistic that uh, we will come out stronger, we will come out good and happy to engage today and hear from yourselves and others what those solutions are and what we can do to go forward. Thank you. As much as um, we may have some challenges, we do have challenges today. I think the confidence is still there and we all I could can still see the prospects and the opportunities that Kenya indeed uh, does present. Maybe if I start with you, Carol, um, this CS ended with a call for partnerships. He said he's looking to partner with us, especially in some of the five, in the five sectors that you highlighted as the key uh, focus for driving the bottom-up agenda. Uh, from Carol, from your perspective, maybe, do we have the framework in place that could drive these partnerships? Yes, we do. We do have two frameworks. One is the public-private dialogue, which we do often with government and the CS knows we are usually at his office often. And uh, there's also the public-private partnerships, which allows us now we have a good framework that has taken some time to really create in a way that private sector can now engage in several, several areas. And we've seen that in, starting with infrastructure. We all know from an economics perspective that um, infrastructure is the foundation of development unless you have any infrastructure. Even those uh, we talked about, mar which includes market development in, in, in terms of the infrastructure and the roads and the logistics, that's important. And that gives us an opportunity as private sector to engage. And that's now more developed. But there are other areas of partnerships that are there. Um, food security. We will not be secure unless we have food security. And so there are opportunities now for agribusiness. There creates other opportunities for partnership where we can use the PPP framework and start creating industries and the whole value chains that now we can start giving. We have a lot of waste and uh, beginning from what we already produce, then there's a, a lot we also import that we shouldn't import. But because we've not had the framework that make it easy for investors to come in, uh, many investors don't want to come and buy tracts of land when it comes to agriculture. They also want to lease you know, to, and be able to produce. Um, I know uh, Honorable Bobilo here, and we've been having this conversation even on issues of palm oil and all that. We've had investors who come to this country and they say, I want to lease 5,000 acres to grow palm oil or to do something else. But um, what we've had before, you're told as an investor, buy the land. 
and you're thinking you don't want to buy 5,000 acres, but you can list and you can also have outgrowers. Um, E-commerce, we talked about innovations. COVID taught us business has to go on and uh, uh, we're promoting e-commerce big for SMEs, but there's a lot of partnerships that we can grow there. In the digital uh, space, um, again, the opportunities that we started, COVID taught us something that we shouldn't lose and that was to be innovative and that's where the partnerships come in to start uh, looking at different areas. Because sometimes when you talk about PPPs, everyone thinks only about infrastructure and we forget there are other areas. When you talk about energy, we talk about 94% of our energy being green. The remaining 6%, apart from developing more on solar, on wind, on uh, hydro, there's green hydrogen. And today we're talking about, I mean, part of this forum is about sustainability. And hydrogen is big. And uh, we've started that. Um, I know we have a company from Australia that has, has, has begun looking into that and looking into partnerships. So again, those creates opportunities for business to develop in terms of uh, uh, PPPs. And so a lot of the issues we are facing today as a country can be turned into big projects and, and under PPP. So hydrogen could kill actually that gap. And hyd the good thing with hyd uh, green hydrogen, not only does it look at sustainability, but uh, byproducts like ammonia can be used for fertilizer, and there's so much more we can do with green hydrogen. Um, then, of course, when you think about climate change, and Kenya has been leading, the numbers look good for us as, 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 um, in terms of a leader in, in climate change. The opportunities in climate change from waste management, again, with counties, and I know when we move to the problems that we are facing, I'll, I'll mention some of those, that, those issues, what are preventing us into moving into that. But waste management, those are projects that we can do as PPPs with government and we especially counties in different areas. So those are just a, a few that I, that I can name in terms of that. And that's on the public-private partnership and because we have a good framework now. And then of course the PPD and that's where we exist as KEPSA to just link business to government and have the dialogues and have these conversations more so that we can come up with solutions, whether they are policies, whether they are laws that need to be changed. Honorable Bilon remembers very well when he was in Senate, a lot of the, the work we did in terms of the, fi the finance side. And of course, now we are looking at um, the competitiveness. We've done very well on the ease of doing business, starting a business and all that, and I'll mention later. But on the competitiveness, that's where our edge needs to move. Otherwise, we'll start losing to our neighbors and we can see what's happening in Tanzania. Um, and they'll start eating our, our lunch if we are not careful. Uh, thank you, Casco. The opportunities are emerging, especially on the sustainability side, and I hope our audience here finds that uh, useful. Honorable Bilo, uh, just building on, on where Carol left, uh, she mentioned about now Tanzania becoming a lot more attractive for investors. Is that a view you share? Uh, is, the current, is the current policy mix uh, taking away some opportunities from us? Thank you. I, I want to, before I get there, let me just say um, I appreciate the point, uh, one statement the CS has made, which is that he wants to listen. Something that is not shared by many of his colleagues, because one of the important things we want in this country is the government to listen, particularly to the local investors and businessmen in this country. This is, this is something that is very important. Um, and on your better, uh, the bottom-up um, economic um, uh, transformation agenda, the gathering here is organized by a bank. When I looked at, uh, while the professor was talking, I looked at um, how much did the banking sector lend to SMEs. And I looked at central bank figures a few minutes ago. In 2021, the total lending to the SMEs was 20% to the SMEs. SMEs account for 80% of the economy in this country. Our country is 80% subsistence economy. 80% of our jobs, according to the government figures, are actually from the SMEs or the informal sector. So you can see um, we, the, those in the elite sectors of the economy, uh, go over up 80% of the lending. But those who actually deserve and who create the jobs, 
the eight percent only get twenty. Probably that is one of the things that um, um, your agenda professor um, should focus on. But coming to the question that um, Faith has asked, it's true. I, I, I share the view that um, in the last, I think, 10 to 20 years, we've been losing our competitiveness as a country in the region. And I want to give that an example where Linus was uh, as a CEO, Smith Klein Bicham. I, I was an auditor when I was with PricewaterhouseCoopers many years ago. Smith Klein, Smith Klein Bicham now is not there. Um, companies that I was auditing when I was with PwC, like Cadbury, like Unilever, uh, many of these companies now um, relocating. In fact, um, at the time, I remember in early 90s, if you were at the border of Kenya, Tanzania, many of the goods that are used in Tanzania from toothpaste to soap to some of the basic necessities were all coming from Kenya. Today, because my business is located on the highway to Tanzania, it's the opposite. We have a large inflow of trucks bringing in goods. Everything from vegetables to fruits, you know, into Kenya. Then the number of trucks that are going into Tanzania. Um, and, 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 and if the CS and any of you, when you go home later this evening, just check, um, go through the toiletries in your bathroom. Check where your toothpaste, Colgate, is coming from. It's manufactured where? Check where your soap, your bathing soap is manufactured. And many of those ones that used to be manufactured here. They probably walk into your, um, and even for the ladies, check all the sanitary pads coming from Egypt. Walk into your kitchen and check your eggs, uh, professor, and check whether your onions are coming from Kenya. Uh, um, you will be surprised that many of these things are now coming from outside um, the country. And all this is because of the um, the laws of competitiveness. And part of the reasons why we have lost the competitiveness, in my view, uh, among other things, is the high cost of energy. Kenya power and lighting that the professor alluded to is one of the major reasons. The cost of energy, um, cost of power, um, among other reasons, of course, um, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why you find companies preferring to relocate. I was just looking at the for example, the corporate tax, if you were trying to invest here, yeah, um, it's one of the highest uh, in Africa. I mean, I was just looking at our main competitors like Egypt and South Africa, they're still below 22% and 27% compared to 30 in the region. But even when we say our VAT you know, rates are competitive in the region, and in the last many years, we have become a bit more uh, smart. We no longer adjust the VOT rates above 16, but we create other um, levies. So if you are in industry, you know, you, 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 know, you, you pay IDF, you pay RDL, you pay... Um, I'm in the food industry, so when I'm importing, I pay uh, I, uh, what do you call uh, nuts and oil crop, crops development levy 2%. And every, so when you add up all the other levies, then the direct taxes also become a bit high. I think many of this for businessmen at the bottom line, at the end of the day, your return of investment is what you are looking at. So when you find it's eroded because of the many other, the challenges that I have mentioned, then people prefer to move to some of the uh, countries in the region. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for those views. Clear. You're right. Reasoning is one of the aspects of trying to understand, one, whether policies are working. Two, which policies and the, the design, how the design can work very better. Because we believe we have different segments of the market and different market segments work differently. But let me tell you, uh, Biro, I came to back to government. Let me give you one statistic that you'll, you'll be surprised. Remember, when I was in the central bank, the tax to GDP, let's say, Kenya was able to pay, to, to finance its development, both the development and recurrent, to the tune of 96%. We only left 4% for uh, grants and even appropriation and aid to be covered 
and also domestic borrowing, just 4%. That time, the tax to GDP, which we call the tax effort, was at 22%. I recall I ignited debate in the East African community when we started talking about convergence criteria that we should actually put a convergence criteria to 25%. My thinking that time is that would almost cross the fiscal gap of 4%. Okay. The reality now has changed. I've come to back to government just to realize that the tax effort had decri has declined from 22% to 13.7% at one time. Not long ago. That's 2020 when I was telling you to, uh, to pump some sense in the government then. Even today I would still tell you, please pump some sense to me. Now, now I'll not be saying the government. I'm not exogenous to the government. I'll be telling you as my friend, pump some sense into me so that I understand the reality out there. Just imagine 13.7% from 22%. This is a structural shift. What could have happened? Now, let, let's put it this way. I saw an article today that says that uh, growth is going to be curtailed because of taxation. My friend, I think I have to go back to school and teach. I think at least I have uh, one of my descendants here. This, look, if government, government is still the major employer, the major investor, the major consumer, isn't it? We still have to push that so that we take, the private sector should enlarge. So in the process, you'll, there's so much that the government has to do. Taxation in itself should not be seen as a factor that leads <laughs> to, uh, to decreased growth. No, 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 no. Because you are taxing returns. You are, you are not taxing returns to investment. You are actually taxing the final income. What is happening here? Any finance bill will define policy. Those policies will be on revenues and expenditures. That the taxes will be raised. Some taxes and levies will be scrapped. Some taxes and levies will be lowered, isn't it? So the whole issue is to look at the, ten, the, 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 the net effect. So we should look at taxation as an incentive. But that is not the way we look at it, because we have moved away from our social contract. This is where the debate should start, I think, uh, my friend. We should now start saying, do we see taxation as a positive thing? The next thing is, where do we ignite the social contract so that we have some positive thing, thinking? I do believe this is where we can go. The, the work of the government is actually to put or to lay the foundation of a proper functioning market. It fits into your cost of production. It is fits into your pricing. It fits into your competitiveness. And you can pick up any other issue you see. But we have to go back and say, what do we need to improve? Because essentially this is where it's beating us. So I'm, I agree with you in terms of cost of doing business, the policy layout. We need to work on this. An intervention that is going to be with us and to remain at the bottom of the pyramid so that instruments don't go, you know, that intervention does not climb the top of the pyramid. It's the people that move up. They will not manage to come and borrow. Most of the SM, micro, uh, micro uh, MSMEs will not afford to come to T DTB because of say, various constraints. But if you intervene them at the bottom, they will start rising up. They will start rising up to the level where they come to the DTB. So essentially, what are we really saying? We are saying we need interventions, both at the bottom and also at the top. The second thing is that we want to make markets work. Markets must work for everyone. And for us to make markets work, it means we have to do a lot of leg work in terms of policies, threatening the space, the terrain. It's, for me, it's very, very important. I used to argue that markets must work for the poor. Those were many years ago, for, for in, we were talking about finance. But right now, we are saying markets especially not financial market, but all the markets must work for everyone because they are going to de determine, they are going to give us the signals in terms of production processes and the future production. 
And the only way you can count your profits or even appropriate returns from, to your own investment is through the market. So our effort should go into making markets work for everyone. So I do agree with you. And that component, it is policy, the institutional DNA. I always talk about the institutional DNA. And we also have to listen to each other in terms of what we really need to do. The more we don't listen to each other, the more we feel uh, alienated. And, 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 and also, more importantly, let's also appreciate policies that work. But because we don't take advantage of policies, that, then we will not get there. Thank you, CS. Caro has something to... Um, I like the conversation we are having right now, and I, again, I think with Treasury, on the tax policy, making it more predictable so that we're not having changes every year, but at least we know we have a predictable policy, tax and uh, policy that can last three years. So as an investor, you're thinking ahead, and you know you have at least three years before there are changes, because that's one of the biggest issues. But the second thing is the licensing regime. And I, again, there's been a conversation, the bill that lapsed, the county-owned source revenue, I know again it has come back, uh, 2023, the majority leader, I know Treasury is involved. Again, that really is what um, the whole predictability of that and the, and the counties. Yes, counties have to raise revenue, but can we have a more predictable policy environment so that we're not having new levies that come up today, next levies that come out tomorrow. No, if we could get that bill sorted out, and we all agree at national level and at counties. So that whole idea of the environment. Then the third one is the licensing regime. Um, and Prof, you remember when you were in CBK and uh, many years and the World Bank was involved then, when we had the bulletin uh, of licenses and really merging, merged, we merged a lot of licenses around 2011, 2010, 2011, but they are all back. You know, and I'll just give you two examples. You know, the, 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 the trade sector, which is the supermarkets and all that, have about 26 licenses to be able to comply with. The tourism sector has 31. And if we go from sector to sector, you can imagine, you know, it makes it very hard, especially now as you're talking about SMEs. They will know, there's no way they're going to formalize and grow if we're going to continue with that. And I think it's another time we can have another exercise to bulletin a lot of those licenses, merge them, remove some of the duplications and multiple licenses, and just make the environment more predictable. So I really agree with you, the Prof, that the idea is uh, really making the policies work and the environment and the biggest challenge right now I think investors are facing is that predictability and multiplicity of licenses and taxes. If we get that right, I think that will sort a lot of those problems. You are right. And one of the things that I have fought against is actually unpredictability of policies. Not even taxation, but all the policies. For me, that is what I go into. But let me talk specifically on policies, and I think, Biro, you know I have talked about this. I'm the first person actually to have actually advised government in 2001 about optimal taxation, for example, of some tax instruments. And that time, I came in to solve a problem between the excisable goods and the, the manufacturers of excisable products and the treasury. And I created a model of actually analyzing optimal taxation. And I showed even the optimal tax and how you need to move away. If the moment you go build the optimal tax, then obviously you start getting less and less revenue, but you distort the market. We had the chance to do that, but there was a very short time to actually do that. And my strong belief, and this is what we're going to implement in future, is that we want to make sure that the tax instruments should not distort the demand structure of the good that you're targeting. Because if you do, what are you trying to do? You kill the goods that trade the golden egg. You have to be, say in game theoretic terms because you have killed the goods. So you should not distort the demand structure of the good in question. The second thing is that the tax should itself should not distort the market. The pricing should not be the one affecting the, the, the market, the source allocation. Because once you affect the relative tri, tri, uh, price structure, it means you distort the market and resource allocation. The third thing is that taxes should not vary the timing 